Well, I promised that we would start promptly at 9, and I would not, I would, it would be wrong of me to avoid uh, complying with my own timetable. So welcome to our joint symposium on international investment and alternative dispute resolution. My great welcome to everyone here to Washington and Lee, who's come to us through planes, trains, automobiles, and even the pouring rain. Today is an amazing day already. We've had some wonderful conversations, some good coffee provided by the law firms of Sherman and Sterling, as well as Curtis, and we're very lucky and fortunate to have that. I hope that we are able to continue that conversation throughout the rest of the day. We have representatives here from every continent on the world except Antarctica which is perhaps unsurprising given that Antarctica is no signatory to an international investments agreement. But we're bringing together different groups of scholars and a cross-section of stakeholders to explore the synergies related to international investment and alternative dispute resolution. My hope is that today that we remember that we have far more in common than we have apart. Given that I have a reputation for empiricism, I wanted to throw a few numbers at you before I ask uh, Anna Jobin-Brett to offer the welcome of UNCTAD. Today is the culmination of six months of blogging by more than 70 stakeholders that have led to eight blog digests, four wrap our tool reports, and over 100 registrants to this particular conference. So we're very, very grateful for everyone's collaboration in that respect. Uh, we hope that you enjoy the three panels today, and we encourage your participation both by Twitter and by Facebook, and that even if you are not physically here in Lexington, but rather joining us from our remote link, wherever you are in the world, I got an email from someone in Ethiopia. I do hope that you enjoy the conference, derive value from it, and uh, feel free to add to the conversation. Anna. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, welcome to all of you, and uh, welcome also to those who are uh, listening and uh, tweeting and participating from uh, uh, more remote parts who are not here with us in Lexington. I'd like to uh, once again extend my very grateful thanks uh, to all the team in Washington and Lee, to the Dean, to Susan, to all the professors, to the students, to the technical support team that has been so helpful in uh, as Susan said, getting us here uh, with all the preparation that was done, it's very seldom that we reach a conference with already such a good understanding of what uh, each and the other panel members and participants have to say about it. So this is really something we hope very much to build on. Uh, I'm supposed to be super brief and I'll try to stick to it, just to tell you that um, we are, of course, very happy for this opportunity to be discussing, brainstorming, but we have also some expectations, which means that we would like to walk out of this conference uh, by the end of the day with some guidance in uh, the work we do, with some ideas uh, of where we should put our efforts, where we should put emphasis in our work, where we should reach out, where we should help uh, get the ideas that are being developed in one area across to another area, which is really very much what uh, we consider is our, our value added here. So we're looking for guidance. We're looking for guidance in several areas. I, I think I'd rather be very precise on that. We'd like to walk out of here with some ideas about what could be done for international investment agreements to be more conducive to mediation. We have currently a system where we have a three-month cooling off period and after that it goes to international arbitration. Is there a way to accommodate in the treaties to interpret uh, this six months or three or six month period in a different manner? Is there a way to build in confidence uh, in uh, alternatives that could be of course carried through as the uh, arbitration process begins? But this is what we would like to hear 
uh, from you? Do you think it would work? Do you think it's needed? Do you think something could be done? The second point that we would like to explore is related to rules, guidelines, whatever can give some confidence on the part of those, I'm thinking more from the government, who are uh, embarking or who are willing to embark on these alternative approaches, what is required to give them the uh, necessary level of confidence that they're not doing just anything, but they're doing something which fits into either their framework or in a more general framework. And this means, of course, everything related to uh, rules, procedure, um, institutional support, whether internally or by the institutions that are involved in international arbitration or in mediation. So I think this uh, unique setting uh, that uh, Susan and Washington and Lee have brought together and to which we are extremely happy to participate, um, so we are expecting from this unique setting uh, also some ideas, some way forward. We, um, I, I have to make a reference to my former director who has really um, left a deep imprint in uh, the way we are thinking and working in UNCTAD. Carl Souvent used to say, uh, the last session is always, where do, we go, where do we go from here? And I'd like to say I go back to Geneva, but with something in my backpack. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Rod Smola, the Dean of the Law School, and I want to extend formal welcome and greetings to you on behalf of Washington and Lee University. Two entities here at the Law School are particularly responsible for supporting the conference. The first is the Francis Lewis Law Center, which is the research and, uh, and uh, a scholarly arm of the Law School. It's led by Professor Josh Fairfield. And secondly, the Transnational Law Center, which is the international arm and global arm of our uh, academic efforts here, led by Professor Mark Drumbel. Uh, as you know, the driving force here at Washington and Lee has been our dear colleague, Professor Susan Frank, and she has approached this conference with passion and with an extraordinary blend of entrepreneurial creativity and organizational discipline. And we're very thankful to you, uh, Susan, for all of that. Uh, and we're delighted to have as our partners the uh, UNCAD, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, and the um, ebullient participation of Anna Jovan Brett, who has been a delightful uh, uh, energizer in our presence here. Uh, I want to also just take a moment to thank the many uh, members of the Washington and Lee staff who have worked uh, tirelessly in preparation <coughs> of the conference and who will throughout the day to make this a successful conference and the many law students who have been and will continue to participate throughout the day. It's a delight to have the help of all of you and uh, the educational experience for our law students. Uh, I want to thank all of the many sponsors who have helped uh, underwrite the conference. Uh, you'll find their um, informational materials uh, adorning the pathways of the conference with a certain um, understated elegance throughout the various uh, 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 the forums that we're in. I want to thank the American Arbitration Association and uh, the personal uh, sponsorship of William and Deborah Slate, uh, and the many law firms who have participated, uh, the Curtis Law Firm, Arnold and Porter, uh, Foley Hoag, Sherman and Sterling, Crowell and Mooring. Uh, I'd like to also thank the American Society of International Law and the Trans Digital Dispute Management Company. It's a delight to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Professor Michael Reisman from Yale. Uh, after graduating from Hebrew University, he uh, got both his LLM and SJD from Yale, and then joined the Yale Law Faculty, where he has served with distinction since 1965. He holds the Myers McDougall Professorship at Yale, which is one of the most prestigious chairs on the Yale Law Faculty. Uh, faculty. And he is truly both a, a worldly and world-class international scholar who has taught in uh, forums throughout the world, including Tokyo, Hong Kong, Berlin, Basel, Paris, and Geneva. Uh, he's been a fellow of the World Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's a former member of its executive council. Uh, he is the president of the Arbitration Tribunal for, international, for Bank International Settlements. 
Uh, he is an extraordinarily prolific and influential scholar, uh, the publisher of many books in the field. Two of his most recent books are Foreign Investment Disputes, Cases and Materials, and International Law in Contemporary Perspective. I can't imagine a more fitting keynote speaker, and we're delighted to have you here, Michael. Please join me in welcoming Michael. Thank you. Generous introduction, and thank you, Susan and Anna, for this awesomely organized conference. I feel a bit like the bastard of the family reunion because any international lawyer of my generation would be bemused by the title of Desperations of today's conference. Since the great American peace movement of the 19th century, with its almost religious belief in compulsory international arbitration, as the great panacea for international disputes and the preventer of war, the movement is the one which created the uh, Permanent Court of Arbitration in 1899. The thrust of the international legal system has moved away from very soft ADR to binding arbitration as the means for resolving international disputes. The General Assembly of the United Nations routinely passes resolutions urging parties to resort to third party decision. And the Institute of Law Internacional has passed a resolution saying that when one party exercises its rights to go against another state, it's not an unfriendly act. A hundred years ago, investment type disputes would have been settled by what was euphemistically called diplomatic protection of nationalists. That if the foreign government did not comply, gunboats would be sent in, the customs house would be secured for several years until the debts were paid off. So to replace this with the, the bit generation's compulsory arbitration is really an extraordinary accomplishment. Of course, the mere fact that there are 2,700 investment treaties with compulsory arbitration clauses uh, means little in itself. International law is really peerless in churning out a lot of paper that means nothing. And the path of international law is strewn with empty promises. But in this case, the treaties have been really quite effective. UNCTAD has identified 318 investment treaty-based cases, most of them having taken place in the last five years. And just two weeks ago, the Financial Times said that the old notion that bringing an action against the state by an investor was deemed to be the nuclear option is no longer considered that, and now it's become a fairly routine activity. But even the number of 318, which seems to loom so large, should be put into context. Uh, it's certainly much larger than the docket of the International Court of Justice from 1945, larger than the entire docket of the Permanent Court, and larger than the docket of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which has been in business since 1899. The gross amount of foreign investment is large, but it's if you put it into the context of international investment, which itself is larger annually than world trade, it's not that large. There are 80,000 multinational enterprises, which by definition are engaged in direct foreign investment, and they have some 100,000 affiliates. If the 180,000 potential claimants, many of them multiple direct foreign investors, and bear in mind that MMEs are not the only direct foreign investors, but if this number, 180,000, is factored by 2,500 or 2,700 bits, then the actual number of potential disputes seems to be minuscule in the universe of direct foreign investment. So this troubling notion that there's been too much arbitration, I think, should be put into context. Now, Professor John Jackson, the great authority on world trade, has observed that less than one half of the disputes that begin in the WTO's dispute settlement, less than one half, actually proceed to decision, uh, proceed to gap panels, and a smaller number of those proceed then to the appellate body. If you think of the continuum of tensions between a foreign investor and the various governing levels of the host state, 
as a continuum in which there are differences over certain issues, many of which are resolved, differences which are not resolved, degrading into disputes, disputes which are not resolved, then degrading into arbitration claims, that you can see that very few cases are actually going on to arbitration. Now, I don't know the number of disputes that are resolved before they uh, reach the submission of the notice of arbitration, but I assume, given the nature of international business, that the vast majority of differences between an investor and a host state are settled, without even using the word ADR. And even those that reach the point of a dispute are settled again without using the word ADR. Uh, Eloise Obadia informs me that even those that actually are submitted to arbitration are still prone to settlement, and only 34% of those which are actually noticed for arbitration to exit, 34% of those are still settled as well. So the point I'm making is that given the gross number of foreign investors and their differences with some level of the government of the host state, the number of disputes that actually go to arbitration is low. And one of the reasons I submit to you is surely the prospect down the road of compulsory arbitration. Compulsory arbitration has also played a major role in lawmaking uh, in a fashion in which ADR cannot do. In a triumph of transparency, most of the decisions in those cases which end in investment arbitration have been published. So there's now an accessible body of case law which can guide government officials, investors, and which practitioners and scholars can use to analyze and to codify jurisprudence. Now, of course, there are discrepancies in this body of case law, but there are discrepancies in American law, as anyone who's participated in a restatement exercise well knows. Treatises on international investment law face the same demands for judgment and synthesis that treatises in developed national legal systems encounter. Just look at, let's say, Dicey and Morris on private international law in, in, in England, in any of its recent editions, to see how many discrepancies there are. The truth of the matter is that these discrepancies are in the nature of law. One is reminded here of the index to H.L.A. Hart's famous book, Concept of Law. In the index, it says, certainty of law, see uncertainty. <laughs> uh, nor has the system of international investment law proved to be loaded against the government party. Now, there is no question that contemporary international investment law is designed to encourage foreign investment, and all the obligations of the treaties, at least in the current generation of treaties, are imposed solely on the state. But Susan Frank's important empirical research has shown that the cases break down pretty evenly and uh, state respondents and claimants <coughs> are about even, and even the successful claimant rarely, rarely receives all that is prayed. Uh, and I think that's thanks to the practice of party-appointed arbitrators, which has a capacity for a latent compromising dynamic within camera deliberations. <laughs> now, I appreciate that the predicate of this meeting is that uh, many are speaking of a crisis in international investment law. And I can see that there have been a few bad decisions. A few states have denounced the exit convention, and others, both in the state investor, state, the investor community, and the NGO community, are grumbling about what they perceive as the unfairness and rigidity of the system. And at the moment, given the vicissitudes of the economy that we're all passing through, politicians, and not simply in developing countries, have resorted to protectionist rhetoric and are beginning to complain about the inherent exploitation of foreign investment. The very effectiveness of international arbitration has been blamed in their suggestions to change it more toward ADR, even though, as the figures that I've reviewed show, ADR accounts for a radical reduction of most different disputes and even arbitrations. Mark Twain said, Reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. 
And before we begin to conclude that the international investment system of arbitration as its centerpiece is dead or dying, I think we should step back and look at the very nature of law. International investment law is a process comprised of lawmaking and law applying. The lawmaking is carried out through negotiation of investment agreements and adjustments in international and national dispute resolution mechanisms. The law application takes place in arbitral and judicial fora. We think of the latter, the fora, as quintessentially adversarial, but the truth of the matter is that even the making of agreements is adversarial. And rather than a crisis, the adversarialism and conflict in all of these really, in my view, show a commitment to investment law. Let me explain. The stresses which investment lawmaking and law applying have experienced in the recent past are, I submit to you, part of a dialectical process characteristic of all robust systems of law. Every legal arrangement is the product of the identification of some common interest shared by those who have shaped it. But no sooner than such an arrangement is installed, it begins to be tested and challenged, not only by those who do not share in that specific common interest, but even by actors within the entities and communities which had established and participated in the arrangement, who've since come to believe that their interests are either insufficiently served or changed. Thus, every legal arrangement, whether substantive or procedural, is always under some pressure for change. The net result is that law, for all its pretensions to being stable and unchanging, is actually a continuous dynamic process of agreement, challenge to that agreement, adjustment, accommodation, new agreement, new challenges, and so on ad infinitum. The struggles through which this process operates are not indicative of a weak system, but rather of a system that's in full vigor. And the especially dramatic dynamism of investment law derives from the convergence of very different interests which it must accommodate and manage. The popular demand <coughs> everywhere to increase national wealth and through some form of distribution to expand economic and other life opportunities for all citizens has become a universal feature of modern life. That this demand can be met solely by autochthonous national development is no longer seriously argued. Responsible officials at the national level, knowing that the positive development now requires a constant flow of incoming and outgoing investment, have little choice to, but to participate in the making and applying of international investment law. Yet, ironically, one of the consequences of more efficient democracies is that these same officials, however clearly they may see their state's long-term interest in an effective investment regime, are prey, especially in times of crisis, to popular clamor for protectionist measures. Corporations, which are simultaneously vital interests for achieving national economic goals, as well as actors seeking to maximize their own profits for their more restricted universe of shareholders, also appreciate that in pursuit of resources and markets, they must operate globally. They understand the indispensability of international investment law, but can also fall prey to the sirens of protectionism when they believe it serves their short-term interest. Please observe that I'm skipping a large amount to stay in your time limits. You're welcome. Everyone, government, business, and ordinary citizens seeking trade and investment and at a level of generality, everyone appreciates the centrality of trade and investment in the achievement of many other development and political transformations. But these same people, governments, corporations, citizens, often disagree on the fine print and its application in popular contexts. Decisions in international law must balance claims for respect for the special requirements of national communities, which is their very raison d'etre, and concern for which is one of international law's central postulates against the need for sustaining the international rule of law. And international investment arbitration plays an indispensable role in this process of accommodation and the competing interests that I've described. But here I will turn to ADR. 
Can international investment laws arbitration be replaced by some modalities of ADR? As I observed earlier, the actual number of differences that degrade into disputes and the disputes that proceed to arbitration appears to be fractional. So one may infer that there is already a substantial amount of what we call ADR occurring. But all of this is taking place within the framework of a compulsory arbitration system. Can ADR go further and replace that investment arbitration? Agreements that can be secured by negotiation are unquestionably superior to solutions to disputes which have been achieved by third-party decision. Negotiated agreements are, at least in the short term, self-executing, and they don't require enforcement, which is the most formidable problem of international law. For this reason, international law puts a high premium on such settlements. Both the Permanent Court of International Justice and the International Court have suspended proceedings when they expected that negotiation might produce a solution. But negotiation without the prospect of compulsory arbitration is a different creature entirely. A multinational enterprise may have annual revenues vastly exceeding those of the host state in which it's invested, but that can be neutralized in particular investment situations. A common feature of direct foreign investment is that the investor has some substantial capital in the host state and cannot easily withdraw it, or as in a trading relationship, cannot simply stop shipping and write off the loss. The Romans said, potior est conditio defendentis. The condition or the situation of the defendant is always stronger. And this is likely to be the situation in direct foreign investment. So rather than a quality of negotiating power, in a strict negotiating regime, things will tilt heavily in favor of the respondent state. Tilt unless both sides appreciate that if negotiations fail, compulsory arbitration will follow. So I would submit that allowing for or even requiring a period of negotiation prior to arbitration may produce a settlement that obviates arbitration, but replacing arbitration with negotiation would not assuage the concerns of the community of investors and provide the incentives for engaging in direct foreign investment. Let me talk briefly about conciliation and mediation. These are modalities prior to compulsory arbitration or adjudication, and they've proved effective as dispute resolution techniques in transactions that have not involved government respondents. And I'm very much in favor of these modalities of ADR in domestic settings. Their promise in international investment law disputes, however, seems to me to be much more limited. As many in this audience will appreciate, all large and complex organizations in which authority is allocated among many different component departments experience difficulty in making decisions, and especially major decisions. That seems especially the situation with respect to governments in international investment <coughs> disputes. Indeed, in states in which there are active political oppositions waiting for an opportunity to criticize incumbents and to replace them, responsibility for betraying the national patrimony by settling with an investor can undermine or even bring down a government or end the, the career of an official. And this seems to be one of the reasons why many land and maritime boundary disputes in which the ineluctable legal decision is perfectly clear to observers are still submitted to third party decision. It's often easier for governments to have the right decision imposed by an outside tribunal rather than conceded by the government. An additional problem with expanding the use of these ADR modalities in investment disputes is paradoxically the contemporary demand for transparency. Mediation in private disputes can be conducted under conditions of confidentiality so that none of the factual data or legal arguments reaches a potential arbitration tribunal should the ADR initiative fail. Ensuring confidentiality in international investment law is much more difficult, not simply because governments by their nature are leaky, but because there is an intense NGO demand for transparency and even for their direct participation. Can you imagine a government trying to negotiate a settlement with the 
progress of the negotiation appearing daily in the major newspapers. Conflict, as I've said, is part of every legal system, and that includes international investment law. Ladies and gentlemen, I certainly concede that there is a role for various forms of ADR, but compulsory arbitration is until now the ultimate mode of conflict resolution in the bit generation. Are there problems with arbitration? Are there better modalities? Winston Churchill famously observed with respect to democracy that it was, quote, the worst system of governance, except for all the others. And I'd suggest that investment arbitration, conflictive, expensive, sometimes inconsistent in its results, is the worst system of resolving international investment disputes, except for all the others. Various ADR methods promise an increase in arbitral utility as long as there is the prospect of compulsory third-party dispute settlement resolution if other efforts fail. The challenges to international investment law are to continuously ensure globally productive enterprise by accommodating diverse interests in arrangements which must be, by the nature of the things, once at once competitive and collaborative. In the best of times, the challenge is daunting. All things considered, the arbitration of investment disputes has not done badly in meeting it in a difficult period. Thank you. Professor Eastman, uh, thanks. As you said, Parta Sun Servanda, and you said you would uh, close uh, at 30, and here we are. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, and it gives us the time for uh, one or two follow up questions. We're certainly very challenged by what you were. Uh, what you just presented because this really makes us think um, why are we gathering here? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure that there will be lots of reactions and thanks very much for setting the threshold of uh, thinking and of contributing so high and uh, so well for us. Thank you very much. Any follow-up questions? <coughs> yes, please. Yes, um, please, uh, I very much enjoyed your talk. There is some precedent uh, in the United States in negotiated rulemaking processes and environmental conflict, environmental and public policy conflict resolution for multi-party negotiation and mediation or um, facilitated negotiation that actually is accessible to the public. And uh, I was curious about how you view those alternatives in this context? Well, thank you for the question. I make a distinction between law making and law applying. Law applying would be arbitration or any other modality of settlement of a dispute once parties have crystallized positions and we have a dispute. With respect to rule making or law making in general, International law has long since come to terms with the fact that since there is no capacity for enforcement, the content of the regime must be one that is largely acceptable to the critical stakeholders. So it makes a lot of sense in those circumstances to incorporate them in the lawmaking process. And I, I endorse it, and I think that its value has been demonstrated, particularly in the area of international environmental law. But I cannot imagine that being transposed to the law applying process, to a situation in which we can imagine a dispute occurs between a major foreign investor responsible for the critical spread of the local economy and the government, or some part of the apparatus of the government. In the continuum in which I've described, it's not resolved at the different stage, that very amorphous stage when parties are just feeling each other out. It matures or morphs into a dispute, and now, before it goes to arbitration, there is a question of some sort of multi-party, large participation negotiation. I cannot imagine that being successful. Uh, uh, perhaps Lisa wants to, to, to 
follow up with. Well, in, in, in dispute resolution, um, we have an analogous uh, distinction between planning negotiations and dispute settlement negotiations. But in dispute system design, there's recognition that even dispute settlement negotiations, which would be the, the analog to your law application category, can loop back to negotiation as the parties change their contract um, mm -hmm. in, in response to the, con to the ambiguity or the, the inherent problem or gap in the contract that gave rise to the dispute. So, and, and you might add, arbitration, arbitrators can't do that. Arbitrators cannot. Yes. No, they're, they're locked into a much more limited world for questioning the measure that they're allowed to do. They're to the mm -hmm. In which case, that raises the question, uh, and I agree that, that in this context, we have to have arbitration as the end point. But the question is, what happens in the shadow of arbitration? And how might you structure that more effectively? And, and I, I think you're absolutely right, and I think the figures that I have, is, as crude as they are, my attempt to generate a figure for the world of potential claimants, 180,000 plus times 20, 2,800 equals, that's a very large group. And it's quite clear from the nature of international business, which is one of problem solving, that there are myriad problems between the investor and the host state mm -hmm. in, in the course of a foreign investment, and most of them are resolved. And some of them may very well be resolved by an adjustment of the terms of the initial agreement. But my point is that once an agreement has reached a, a critical stage, uh, I'm sorry, a dispute has reached a critical stage, the possibilities, as I see it, of using the techniques of ADR mm -hmm. are not very great. And that's because of the nature of modern government and, ironically, the demands of NGOs for transparency, which has been very beneficial to the system, and the increased participation as a result of democratization. I have Kathy and uh, Roberto, Nancy, and Maria. Um, I, I, I appreciate your comments. I'm wondering if we might just probe a little bit one of your hypotheses, which seems to be that, I think if I understand, that all disputes that arise in this context are not appropriate for a negotiated or some kind of facilitated workout. And I'm wondering if you draw a distinction given the nature of the dispute. I'm wondering if your hypothesis holds for, for those disputes that are law-based or rights-based or contractual-based, and whether you draw a distinction between those disputes that are contractually or legally based and those disputes that are relationship or transactional based. I have a little trouble being a professor of law from not finding law in everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's an honest answer. <laughs> Uh, Roberto and then Nancy. Yes, uh, thank you, Professor Ryan. Um, coming from a developing country, I fully, fully agree with you that one of the most important developments uh, in international law, in the investment area in particular, has been this rule orientation uh, for the settlement of disputes that the system is providing. Having said that, I have two, two observations. One, you, you um, say basically that the number of disputes is relatively low. Mm -hmm. in comparison to, to all these parts of the state. But do you think that's low because there's a lot of APR or because there are certain kind of businesses that just simply do not have access to the system? I'm thinking, for example, in the small firms uh, in which uh, doing investments around, you know, between two million, three million, ten million dollars in developing countries, or even abroad, even in developed countries too, where going to uh, arbitration, uh, it may be more costly huh, than the amount of investment actually made. So a lot of these SMEs might just have uh, kind of a door closed huh, to this kind of, uh, uh, of dispute. And just a question for you. And the other point that actually I also would like to, to, to raise for the discussion is, what is the problem then? I mean, why are we here? 
I mean, if, if, if the system is working so well, why everybody is, is like talking about ADR? Uh, and, and I want just to, to feed the discussion uh, in the other perspective. Um, I think, in addition to that, I mean, there are different points of view how to, to assess the problem. One is from the from outside perspective and seeing it's a governance, uh, it's a whole system of international law. But if you, I mean, there's another important dimension, and it's a domestic dimension of the host countries, where uh, actually these agreements can be very useful to foster the rule of law, the strengthening of institutions in a way. And uh, I just want to ask you whether, well, I'm convinced on that, that certain kind of disputes, not all, but certain kind of disputes just arise because, not because the obligations are new to the state, because a lot of the obligations that are in the BITs or international agreements are already embedded in the constitutions of a lot of these countries. The problem is the institutional weaknesses, and that these this, uh, substantive obligations, for one reason or another, are just not compliant huh, for, for a, lot of, a lot of factors. And therefore, when these uh, investment uh, agreements came, put the pressure, just make evident the weaknesses in the domestic adjudication system. Now, having said that, then the challenge comes. How do you politically sell uh, the advantages of having these agreements, which, by the way, I fully subscribe to, huh? I'm, I'm not challenging that point, but these agreements foster domestic reform. So the old issues groups that are against that domestic reform uh, may challenge the merit systems of these agreements, uh, both domestically and internationally. So just for some food for thought to see your, your insight. Uh, I, I think that they're, they're very thoughtful and provocative observations, and I'd like to address them. I, I identify three separate issues. The first is one which I have frequently discussed with my students, and that is the cost of international investment disputes, something I've had the benefit of reading Susan's most recent manuscript on this, from which I learned a great deal. Uh, and there is no question that smaller investors sometimes have to abjure exercising rights of dispute resolution, which may have been a factor in their decision to engage in a foreign investment, because they calculate that even if they were to prevail, they would not win anything. I'm not talking about the transaction costs of having a difficult relationship with the host government. And one of the things that has come up in my own discussions with students is whether there should not be at the World Bank something equivalent to the IFC, a cheap window. In other words, a much more expedited, smaller, if you like, chamber music rather than symphony orchestra style of arbitration, which would be one of the options available, something that uh, as a parallel to exit. <coughs> but I, I take your point, and there is no question it's not simply exit, but it would be unsupproll, however, however it's managed, your permanent court of arbitration. All of them, though they might be subsidized by the institution, are very, very expensive. So one question <coughs> might be the creation of, as it were, a cheap window, like on the order of the, the IFC. As the question, why are we here, <laughs> which you asked, I'm reminded of, uh, of a chaplain speaking to some veterans who came back from one of the recent wars who were all shell-shocked and suffering from post-conflict trauma. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, why are we all here? Have you ever wondered, why are we here? And someone from the back of the uh, hospital will chat, because we're not all there. <laughs> Perhaps. Uh, the, I, I'm sorry, but I'm getting some of the uh, the, the question of the transformative, latent transformative role of international investment law is something that the World Bank has discussed and has it had come up in some of the papers that the World Bank has released. And I know from co-teaching with the person who negotiated the NAFTA agreement for Mexico that uh, President Salinas was very aware of the fact that the agreements that were being made would compel Mexico to make adjustments in its domestic system. And he's very comfortable. He viewed this, in fact, as a useful instrument. So if the elite is committed to that, or the critical person at the pinnacle of the, the structure is committed, 
that investment agreements can be secured. Of course, if the local government is not interested in such a transformation, then there's a problem, and that may in fact stop the investment agreement. Thank you. Nancy, please. Nancy Welsh from Penn State Law School. Um, first, I, I'm also coming from the dispute resolution community, um, and I want to make it very clear, at least, I, I think, I speak for myself, but I suspect this is for many others who are committed to dispute resolution and looking at alternatives to arbitration. There is no desire to replace arbitration. Arbitration is an essential part of this system. You're absolutely right. It has to be there as a counterweight in order to enable every other procedure, potentially, to be as fair and useful as possible. No desire to replace. But I wonder whether the reason we're here is not necessarily because of the number of arbitrations, but instead because problems have arisen with the enforcement of arbitral awards. And then that reveals a weakness in not the system itself, but in its ability to deliver what it says it's going to deliver. And so then when you draw this distinction between law applying and law making, I find myself wondering whether the difficulties with enforcement reveal that in some instances at least, arbitration is unable to deliver law applying, and there is a need then to recycle back to some of these other procedures, which I think is in a way what mm -hmm. Professor Bingham was talking about, and look at these other procedures as Lawmaking once again, private lawmaking readjustment because there is not going to be the ability to enforce. And one last point. <coughs> As I look at international commercial arbitration, it seems to me that its ability to enforce has come not just from the coercive power of states or external actors, but from the moral suasion of being members of a merchant community who will themselves enforce. But today's situation suggests to me that there's neither coercive power available nor the moral suasion necessarily. So there is a need to recycle back in order to strengthen international, the, the, the use of binding arbitration. Uh, I think that, that there are very perceptive observations that I may say about that, and I'm not sure that I have an answer to them. The, the notion in an ongoing relationship that a problem that comes up that can be adjusted to the mutual satisfaction <coughs> of the parties, such that the productive relationship can continue, is much better than a third party decision. I agree entirely. And I also can see that one of the problems with international investment arbitration is that the tribunals do not have the power to make an adjustment by well, some tribunals now are moving very tentatively towards specific performance and toward orders that make certain adjustments. But there is always a fear in the tribunals that this would involve an excessive jurisdiction if, if one of the parties subsequently uh, concludes it doesn't serve its interest. So I can see that point. With respect to the comparison between commercial, international commercial arbitration and international investment arbitration, I, I would ascribe considerably less force to the moral suasion of merchants, which I have not seen much evidence of, and much more to Article 4 and Article 5 of the New York Convention, which, you, which permit the claim of the award creditor to mobilize the power of the local court where there are assets for purposes of enforcement. And I think that possibility is a critical factor in parties that have lost simply moving towards settlement or, or simply paying the award. So I, I, I think that now the notion of making adjustments in contracts after there has been, let's say, a taking or a government has acted in violation of the agreement such that there is a substantial reduction in the value for the investor seems to me to be very problematic. The nature of international investment is that it's global. When company X goes into state Y, with an investment of $700 million to put in a plant for gas transmission or water transmission or something like that. It's involved a number of international banks. It has acquired political risk insurance. The political risk insurance is issued only because there's a bilateral investment treaty with an arbitration possibility. If you substantially reduce the profits by renegotiation, there's a ripple effect 
on the banks, a ripple effect on anyone who's provided insurance. And these are consequences that it seems to me can't be filtered out. You've got to look at everything and not simply a bilateral relationship. That, in my view, makes it much harder to simply say, as you might say, in a simple bilateral domestic setting, well, we can simply have an adjustment of contract. May I follow up just what you one sentence? And that simply is that um, there will be no result unless there's a negotiated result, and perhaps those other players need to be at the table as well, which again relates to the public policy facilitation. <coughs> Well, thank you so much, Professor Reesman, and for the lovely discussion.